To get to an answer to this question will require a bit of time and a somewhat lengthy response because it's necessary to go back through the history of events for the last year and a quarter. And let me take you back to San Antonio in November of 2010 where ASSE had a symposium and the title of it was Rethink Safety, A New View of Human Error and Workplace Safety. It was a highly successful program. The attendance exceeded expectations. I was to speak on designing out the error provocative. And because the subject didn't seem to fit, fit that closely with the pattern of subjects listed in the program, I didn't expect much of an attendance. And especially since I was on the last afternoon, but the attendance was rewarding. It would, people were definitely interested in designing out the error provocative. So also though I was shocked, pleasantly shocked, at what the speaker said, which was so contrary to what I expected on human error. You, you would expect comments on cognitive theory, the properties of human cognition, variable errors and constant errors, and such as imperfect rationality, etc. But I was so surprised when, when so many of the speakers spoke on how to improve human error uh, avoidance and correction, and they indicated to me by a composite of what they said, there's a transition taking place with respect to human error prevention, human error correction. And at the same time, I'm saying to safety professionals, because of the nature of the comments they made, you need to understand there's a transition also taking place in the practice of safety. Now let me give you some examples of what the speaker said. One speaker devoted a large part of his time on human errors to the result from design errors. I wasn't expecting that. He said that the best solution in such cases where you have human errors is to first ask what kind of a workplace did we design? What kind of work methods did we design? And he also implies that the other types of solutions would be administrative, and if you had designed an error provocative situation, they weren't going to work. Another speaker spoke of the influence of equipment of safety design, system design on human performance, and he went through the first elements of the hierarchy of controls, which as you know will start with elimination, engi engineering, substitution, that sort of thing. He did not get into the workings of the mind. A slide read, and I'm going to read this to you, managers may wish to address human error by getting into the heads of their employees. Training is often the default correction. And when he said that, I sort of chuckled because having reviewed 1,700 incident investigation reports, training is too often the default solution and it won't work if hum the, the design of the system and of the work methods is error provocative. So nevertheless, he went on to say, if error potential is designed into the work, this is again, he, they kept using the term design. If error, or, uh, if error potential is designed into the work, you have to go back into the design of the system. Another speaker, when errors occur, they expose weaknesses in the defenses designed into systems, processes, procedures, and the culture. It's management's responsibility to anticipate errors and to have systems and work methods designed so as to reduce the potential for human errors. Now, several speakers cited the work of Sidney Decker as a resource in support of their comments. And at that time, that went right past me. I did not respond to the name Sidney Decker, and I'll get to that name again a bit because my impression now is his writings have had a major impact on the thinking of human error professionals in the, in the world. Nevertheless, now let's come to the reason why I'm here. On October of 2011, the paper which is the subject of this interview appeared in Professional Safety. It's titled, Reviewing Heinrich, dislodging two myths from the practice of safety. I had two major purposes, and that was to move the emphasis on the prevention efforts 
in occupational risk management from focusing on the employee to focus on the system in which the employee works. And the second theme was to dispel the idea that serious injuries would be reduced comparably as incident frequency is, is reduced. Now comes the letters to the editor, of which there were several. One of them came from E. Scott Geller, who is somewhat famous, somewhat well-known throughout the world with respect to behavioral safety. And let me give you some quotations from what he wrote. Behavior is an outcome and not a causal factor. That's a shocking statement coming from somebody who has uh, devoted at least the last 30 years to behavioral safety. I repeat what he wrote. Behavior is an out outcome and not a causal factor. Now, when I get to comments later on from Decker, you will see the reference to the relationship to what uh, Geller is saying and what the speaker said at the conference last uh, a year ago, November. Geller also wrote, as, one, as the one who first coined the term behavior-based safety in 1979, some professional safety readers may be surprised to learn that I agree completely with Mr. Manuel's analysis, conclusions, and recommendations. My partners, this is Geller still now, my partners following Deming's sage advice, don't blame people for problems caused by the system. Again, D Geller, I agree completely with Manuel's point that we need to look for system factors. I sent copies of Geller, Geller's letter to some of my colleagues. One of them called me to ask, Fred, did you write this as a fake? And I had to tell him it would be printed. And the letter was printed exactly as Geller wrote it. Now, keep in mind what he's saying. Deming was known throughout the world for his expertise in quality management. But he emphasized improving the design of the system in which, the, in which people, good people, could produce good quality. He also said that if, you, if the system is inadequately designed, you will never produce the quality level that you need, and the same applies to safety. So Geller's letter came as a surprise to me as it did to others. Uh, then, but a colleague then said to me, if you want to understand what's happening in the human error field, you must read Sidney Decker. So I bought Sidney Decker's book. The, he is a professor of human factors and system safety at Lund University in Sweden. But he gained his doctorate. Now let me give you the title of his doctorate, which is intriguing because it may have a bearing on his thinking. The doctorate is in cognitive systems engineering. Cognitive, up until this time, would not have matched system engineering for me. But he got his degree from Ohio State University and I can see you put the two themes together, cognitive and systems engineering, and that may give you a reason why he wrote what he wrote. So uh, Decker's book is titled The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. It was published in 2006. Now if I give you, I'll give you a few excerpts from it and you'll, you'll be able to relate what Decker wrote in 2006 to what I'm now hearing from uh, in, uh, human error control people at this time. This is what, what Decker wrote. Human error is not a cause of failure. It is the effect or symptom of deeper trouble. That's a base statement that Geller made that relates to everything else that I've said to you in this interview up to this point. He also says to understand error, you have to dig into the system in which people work. You have to stop looking for people's shortcomings. Dig into the system and you'll find that the worker then is doing pretty much what the system compelled him to do because of the design of the work system and the design of the work methods. He went on to say error has its roots in the system surrounding it. The deeper you dig, Decker says, the more you will understand why people did what they did based on the tools and the tasks and the environment that surrounded them. The view that accidents really are the result of long-standing deficiencies that finally get activated has turned people's attention to upstream factors. What that means is the focus goes from the worker into the decision making above the worker with respect to design decisions and work methods decisions. Now, James Reason, who is also world renowned for 
for his writing, he was quoted by Decker. And his quotation I'm going to give you verbatim. Rather than being the main instigator of an accident, operators tend to be the inheritors of system defects created by poor design, incorrect installation, faulty maintenance, and bad management decisions. Their part is usually that of adding the final garnish to a lethal brew whose ingredients have already been long cooking. Now that's a quotation from uh, Reason's book on human error. Now let me conclude for the first answer that I'm to speak to today. Understand what's occurring in the field of human error prevention and correction. The mood is to look into the system in which the worker works. Get off the, 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 the worker with respect to a focus point, presuming that if you change his behavior, you have resolved all the problem. The problem will not be resolved if the work system and the work methods are designed to be error provocative, error inviting, error inducing. Those are the terms that are repeating in the literature these days. There's a transition taking place with respect to human error prevention. There's also a transition taking place with respect to the practice of safety, as you will see in the constant never-ending references these days to design, 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 design the work system and the work methods.